A big part of my career has been looking at the therapeutic value of the 12 steps because the 12 steps really have harnessed some powerful psychological forces that creates an amazing change in our life. What does that change? Well, the truth is, is that the 12 steps are engineered to help us achieve emotional sobriety, to achieve true independence of spirit, to achieve autonomy, to learn how to take care of ourselves. These are things that we don't know. Emotional sobriety really helps us learn how to have a healthy relationship, how to have union with the preservation of our integrity, how to cooperate with integrity. Most of us get lost in our relationships. Most of us do a lot of things we don't want to do. We don't really know how to show up in a good way. Emotional sobriety is about learning to have healthy relationships. Well, here we are now. We're looking at the third... Um, Essential Insight for Emotional Sobriety. Uh, we've spent several weeks talking about waking up from our sleepwalking. And as we've talked about, many of us have, you know, the alarm's gone off in our life several times and we just keep reaching over and hitting snooze and hitting snooze. And, and then eventually something happens and usually it's some kind of a catastrophic experience that just creates so much pain that we can't ignore the alarm any longer and we start to wake up and it you know herb uses oftentimes this idea of thawing out and that's kind of what happens as we arouse out of our sleep we don't just wake up and now we're jumping out of bed and we've got a full head a, a full experience of consciousness and awareness and stuff like that it's a process that is more and more akin to that thawing out. We wake up a little bit at a time and a little bit more and then a little bit more. And as our awareness and consciousness grows, then we move towards the second insight that I talked about, which is living consciously and really cultivating that consciousness with an understanding that I need I need to develop my consciousness because it's with my consciousness that I make contact with my life, with myself, with my experience. And it's through my conscious experiencing of those events in my life that I begin to learn by unpacking them and bringing a curiosity to what happened here. How come I reacted this way? And as we start to get curious about it, we start to see a certain pattern in our life. And that's where we start to discern our emotional dependency. And that's what the third insight is, is discerning our emotional dependency. Emotional sobriety is, is dependent on us developing an awareness of our dependency our focus on environmental support, mainly because we haven't developed the ability to support ourselves. So let me talk about that for a minute is, so what makes it so important to own our emotional dependency? How come that becomes such an important part of and even foundation to emotional sobriety? So, um, One of the things that I wanted to emphasize today is that when I own that I'm emotionally dependent is when I can start to change. We've talked many times about the power of what we call the paradoxical theory of change. It's when I own what I'm doing and who I am, rather than trying to be someone I'm not, that the change process begins now, how do we know that to be true? Well, if you've worked step one, you have a very personal experience of that, is when you finally admit it, that you're powerless, then you are able to start to discover another power, a power that's not based on your ego, but on something greater than self, right? That's the important things that happens in step one. And then when the second half of that is when we admit 
that our life has become unmanageable, the paradox is, is there is that we begin to learn how to manage our life based on this new source or foundation of power that we have. Well, same thing is true here. When I admit that I'm emotionally dependent, I can start to see how true that is and in all the different ways that that manifests itself. You know, I remember when I um, worked step four and my sponsor had me go through it. And as I got into the last column and I started to look at, well, what was my part in all of this? You know, self kept coming up. But when I've gone back and looked at those things that I wrote down before, and even as I've added to that inventory today, I see emotional dependency is where the self got manifested. It was all about me because I expected so much from my environment and so little from myself. So... Owning this emotional dependency helps us develop an honest relationship, first with ourself, and then with our relationship with others, and ultimately our relationship with reality. And we've defined that several times, that emotional sobriety is having an honest relationship with self and others and with reality. We've also talked about before that acceptance is a prerequisite to making any kind of change in your life. If you can accept what you're doing, then you can start to change. Without accepting it, you're not going to be able to create any change. You know, we cannot transcend the way I wrote it here. We cannot transcend our the environmental support that we're looking for until we see the extent and severity of this condition. Now, what do I mean by environmental support? Because you hear me use that almost synonymously with emotional dependency. Well, environmental support is where I look for, to my environment to provide things like my self-esteem, my sense of security, my being okay. I look to my environment to make me feel good about myself. Now, I said here before that, and I've said it before, and I want to say it now and really emphasize this, this doesn't mean that we're pathological, that something's wrong with us, because we all start our experience as a human being being 100% dependent on our environment for support. We're incapable of supporting ourselves. In the womb, we're incapable of providing ourselves with the necessary nurturing and sustenance and, and oxygen and all the things that we need to start to develop for the fetus to grow into, you know, a child. But once we're born is we take the first act of self-support. People say, well, what is that? It's breathing. Now, instead of depending on the umbilical cord to provide me with oxygen, it's my job to inhale and exhale for me to take oxygen in and then convert it to use it in my body and then get rid of the carbon dioxide. That is now my responsibility the minute I'm born. So from that moment on, I take responsibility for that. I also have to start to participate in getting the sustenance and nurture, nourishment I need from my environment. If the child, if I'm breastfed, then my job is the suckling of the mother's breast. If I'm not breastfed, then it's being able to drink from the bottle. I have to use, I have to suck to take in that milk or that formula. And then my body starts to use that to support myself. But I'm still dependent on the environment to provide me with that nourishment. Now, early on, I can't go ahead and crawl up on my mother. She has to place me on the breast and oftentimes help me get attached because I'm that dependent. But our life from that moment on is moving from this undifferentiated state that we were inside the mother's womb to more and more differentiated state, which means that we're supporting ourselves. The more differentiated I become, 
the more support that I provide for myself in terms of getting my needs met from the environment. Now, you know, in terms of things like walking and speech, it's highly dependent on our neurological development. And so around the age of one, a child is going to start to crawl. Eventually, you know, what they first rock on their hands and knees is they're starting to develop the coordination of muscles and some, you know, um, some strength, some core strength. And then eventually they'll start to crawl which is all the rudiments, all of the coordination is taking place because we're going to need to be able to do that when we walk. Then we start to pull ourselves up on a coffee table or something like that, hit our noggins, I'm sure a few times, let go of the coffee table and we learn how to balance. I'm supporting myself by that. Now, maybe mom or dad will stick a hand out, but then they'll pull their hand away and give me a chance to figure out how to do this myself. Every time I fall, when I lose my balance, my body is calculating all of the information from that fall and helping me be successful the next time around or moving me towards being successful. After I figure out how to balance, then what do I do next? I take my first step. Parents make a big deal out of it, right? Oh my God, he's made his first step. Alan made his first step. Yay, yay, yay. And, you know, then I take my first step and fall. How many times do I fall before I learn to walk? As many as I need to. Thank goodness we don't have the consciousness we have as adults that says how many times I should fall before I learn how to walk. Because if we did, I don't think any of us would be walking. I think we'd be a species on our hands and knees still. So we go ahead and we fall and we pick ourselves up and we do it again and we do it again until we master walking. Once we get walking down, what do we want to do next? We want to run. And then there's a lot of scraped knees, scraped elbows, stuff like that happening. And when a child falls, what's the first thing they do? They look to their parents and say, how should I feel about what just happened to me? If a parent freaks, freaks out, the kid's going to freak out. If a parent stays calm, the kid's usually calm, unless they're injured in a bad way. Typically, they're not. So all of this unfolding neurologically is just hardwired into us. It's instinctual. Same thing with speech. We start imitating sounds and eventually, and that takes place from very early on. I don't know if you remember some of the videos in Acredolo's class, Roger, that we saw in developmental psychology, but... This stuff, this imitating sounds was a taking place within the first few months of life yeah. is that we have that desire so early on. And then those sounds become words and that by a year, the child has a couple rudimentary words and now they start to develop language, which is a very complex system that they start learning. And that's all hardwired. Why does a child develop that? Because they want to be connected. They want to be a part of, they want to join the community. They want to be a part of the family. That's all hardwired into us. Now, emotionally, the ability to support ourselves and to be differentiated is a whole nother thing altogether. It doesn't just happen. It takes an awful lot of, you know, certain coaching and a certain kind of an experience with our parents, a certain kind of ex messages in our culture and stuff like that. And so none of us really get much help at all along these lines. <clears throat> a fellow by the name of John Gottman, who's known now for his work with marriages and the seven habits of highly successful marriages and stuff like that, before he turned into work to focusing on research with marriage, he looked at helping kids. And what he called the heart of parenting was learning how to become an emotional coach for your children. Because he saw that as the most critical thing after our kids, you know, become four or five years old. Now it's learning how or coaching them to help them learn how to handle their feelings. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, you know, Dan Siegel says we parent from the inside out. We have to know how to deal with our own feelings if we're going to help a kid deal with their feelings. And if we don't know how to deal with our feelings, we don't have much to pass on. 
So that's where this becomes quite a challenge for a lot of parents is that we don't know how to deal with our own feelings because nobody's necessarily helped us figure that stuff out, especially feelings like being disappointed or failing, making mistakes. Those things are an anathema in our culture. We want to avoid those things because they make us feel terrible. Like we're a bad person or we're not a good person. We all want to be a good person. So these are all of the things that are happening for us. Now, the other thing that, so what I'm saying is, is that our emotional dependency, you know, this need for environmental support just means that we got stuck in our development. It doesn't mean that we're messed up and that we're somehow pathological. We're just arrested. And we can learn how to do this stuff. I know we can. We have the capacity. There's a force inside you that wants to help you move in that direction, that wants you to actualize whatever tendencies you have that are possible. And it is possible for us to learn how to hold on to ourselves and to stand on our own two feet. And that doesn't mean that we become independent and don't need anyone. It just means that we start taking responsibility for our needs instead of making other people responsible for how we feel and what we need. Dr. Nathaniel Brandon calls that the core of self-esteem is taking responsibility for ourselves. Now, this emotional dependency what it does is it makes other people too important. Now, unfortunately, in a romantic relationship, as you fall in love with someone, eventually that person's going to grow more and more in terms of importance to you. And the more important they become, the more trouble is going to happen unless you have the ability. So if this is how important a person's becoming, and this is my ability to hold on to myself and to support myself, if my ability to support myself doesn't keep pace with how important a person is becoming to me, and there's a gap in between, this is where trouble shows up. Because now my inability to support myself is going to now activate all of these rules and demands and claims and, un and, and expectations I have on how that other person's supposed to behave for me to be okay so we make other people way too important when we're emotionally dependent and that we don't have the ability to support ourselves when it's not equal to the other thing that happens when we're emotionally dependent is we do not see the other person so we make them too important but at the same time unimportant because we don't see them as a person who has needs themselves. We only see them in terms of what they can or cannot do for us, you know, looking for their approval or fearing their disapproval. So when we're emotionally dependent, we fail to see and we fail to, we, we, we expect to be seen is a better way for me to say it. And we fail to see. I'll say that again. When we're emotionally dependent, we expect to be seen, but we fail to be to see. We expect to be loved, but we're fa we fail to give real mature love. We want to be understood, but we fail to understand. In fact, I could say that we demand to be seen. We demand to be loved. We demand to be understood. We demand to be considered, but we fail to give all of these things to the other person because our emotional dependency makes everything about us. This is where we become egomaniacs with inferiority complexes at the same time. Why is it if I feel bad about myself, I walk into a room thinking everybody's thinking about me? See, it's that crazy thing that happens. This develops another validated self-esteem. My self-esteem, my emotional dependency develops this other validated self-esteem. My self-esteem is dependent on how you feel about me, how you treat me, what you say, what you do, your attitude towards me. 
It's also that we develop an other validated sense of security. My security is dependent on how thoughtful you are about me and how I'm feeling. Our consciousness is also influenced by our emotional dependency. We develop an I'm okay if consciousness. Everything is based on a contingency. If this happens, I'll be okay. If that happens, I'll be okay. And this is what turns us into control freaks because we want to control the I'm okay if. Well, that's those are some of the things that that make it important for us to see this. We've got to be able to own these things and see how these things manifest in our lives in order to be able to do something about it. I'm going to be coming back in a few weeks after Roger and her share about this insight themselves and i'll be talking more about emotional dependency and especially how we start to unpack our disturbances to be able to identify our unenforceable rules our claims our demands as well as the unhealthy dependence that we have so with that being said let me invite roger and herb into this space and you guys can share a few things and then we'll open it up for people to share what they've become aware of with their emotional dependency. Good evening, Joe. Thank you, Al. Hey, Al. Hey, Herb. Hello there, <clears throat> Hello there gentlemen. <laughs> Would you like to kick well, us Herb, off? Herb, welcome back from Hawaii. How did the oh, connection go? It was uh, not your typical journey for me. Uh, for me, it was, but I uh, went there for uh, eight days, and I left my room for an hour and a half every afternoon to take a walk. And uh, uh, if there were people to meet with, I did do that. But I used it as a retreat and uh, sort of a reflection time of period and it and to unplug and to rest. So it was just wonderful. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um. <clears throat> You know, you started by talking about the thawing out, and it's <laughs> it, that's really in my face these days, thinking about the journey of the last 39 years coming up on 40. It's made an impression. That's a long time. And, and the journey has been one of improved consciousness. That's the, I'm so aware this year, more than any other time, even with the major awakenings I had through the step processes, various uh, stages of my recovery, uh, and this year I'm so conscious of the improved consciousness and the importance of that. Um, and I loved, I've not heard the phrase before ever, and certainly not from you, uh, that was cultivate consciousness. I mean, I, it just... That rang my bell. I really resonated with that because that's indeed what we've done intentionally or unintentionally by staying kind of close and in the center of this program and this community that we have. Um, and I just made the notes that I, I do reading, I do thinking, I do writing, I do meditating. But part of the key is accountability. I have several accountability partners, a professional and friends and or within some other kind of venue that I've uh, been very intentional about having as accountability partners. Uh, when Mary died five years ago, the, my two daughters, who are both 30 years in a 12-step program, they stepped right up. And it's different, but it's it, it's a wonderful, uh, not replacement, but um, development in terms of a, a, a consciousness and an accountability, because they love to tease me, of course, and that's always good if I can take it with a sense of humor. Um, the, um, the environmental support concept is something that I hope everybody really embraces and, and plums the depths of it. Because it's a catchy phrase, environmental support. Oh, I could throw that out in the meeting and it sounds really cool. But it's really cool when you come to grips with, that's the only place I ever sought support until I began to become conscious. 
And even in that beginning, it wasn't as relevant as it has been in the last 20 years, where I've really seen, and maybe it's because of some of the work, Dr. Berger, that you and I have done in terms of facilitating even these concepts with other people. That's been an in incredible source of my own personal conscious growth of consciousness itself in trying to communicate it and then listen to other people's awkward journey in trying to experience it and then communicate it. Um, and so that's another thing that I'm very conscious of with regard to the workshops. The feedback and working with a variety of people and trying to be kind and patient and tolerant and helpful, which are not my normal gifts. Um, it has so used like the steel on steel concept from the, uh, the Bible. It says steel on steel sharpens both sides. And that's literally the consciousness that has developed over time um so so much oh and then i heard a great phrase and i'm just this a random thought uh unity without uniformity mm. isn't that cool yeah because it's right along the lines of what you're talking about where we're talking about independence connected to interdependence and then the from line that you like and i love but i can never remember how to quote it um yeah, so, union, union with the preservation of integrity. That one. Yeah. I mean, it, that it's worthy of several days of meditation. Yeah, it really is. Yes. Unity with the preservation of integrity. And, and so just this last year, <laughs> you press my button. Uh, just this last year, I've seen that my consciousness has grown as I've intended to be conscious and more conscious and I've practiced it and I've practiced it. And, and the insight I have right now is that I'm in relationship with consciousness itself. That's the God of my not understanding is pure consciousness. So to the extent that I can improve my consciousness, I'm more transparently aware of the, the unity with consciousness. Now, that may be poetic, and it may be way beyond even my own understanding, but that's where I'm at in my current awareness. Thank you, Herb. Thank you. Thanks, Herb and Alan. Um, gosh, Al, as I was reading through Chapter 5, uh, the third essential insight, um, I had so many awarenesses. My feeling is like, okay, here we are. Now we've arrived at the core of what we're talking about. Emotional dependency and all the, all the different aspects of it. Um, becoming more aware of how our specific emotional dependencies manifest themselves. All the expectations, all the unreasonable expectations, all the demands, all the efforts at control. And so it's, I just had this sense of like, that we're now really into the meat, but we have to lay the stage first by talking about waking up from our sleepwalking and living more consciously. That's where Brandon starts with self-esteem. He's not talking about emotional sobriety explicitly because that's, as you said, Alan, that's the foundation. And as you just talked about for several minutes, Herb, my relationship to my own awareness. Um, some writers say that that's where spiritual growth, I feel like it's where all of our psychological and spiritual growth begins, where we begin to make our own awareness the object of our attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As opposed to what everybody else is doing, and again, Alan, and you said it, but I just want to reiterate it. We're not talking about functioning in a way in the world where we're independent of, of you know, being reliant on our environment. We're constant. I mean, for every breath we take, to use the most clear and simple example, for every morsel of food we eat, for every sip of liquid, liquid we, we take in, not to mention every item of clothing we wear. I mean, 
on and on and on. We are unbelievably dependent on our environment as adults. But the distinction is, as an adult, I can learn little by little how, by paying attention to all the ways I'm not particularly independent or autonomous, but I can learn how to take more responsibility for engaging my environment in a way that better meets my needs and where I also can contribute to the needs of others being met. So again, please, we all slip into it at times because these ideas are so hard to, to really deeply understand. So we simplify and we fall into black and white thinking, but these are not, there's no place for black and white thinking here. Of course, we're incredibly interdependent with other people and with our environment. I was thinking about um, the analogy of learning to walk because I, I was watching some, some videos the other day, some psychologically oriented videos. And the guy was laughing that this, uh, he was a neurologist, but he said, you know, thank God I didn't have an adult mentality when I was learning how to walk. And you, I'm only coming back to it because you mentioned it. He said, I would have never learned how to walk. He said, I'm so perfectionistic and unforgiving as an adult with new things I take on to learn. It unbelievably slows down my learning process because I'm filled with judgment and I, I stay focused on the, the past, not not constructively, like analyzing what, what led me to do that wrong, but just in terms of beating up on myself. He said, the beautiful thing about children learning, at least for a period of time, is they don't care. <laughs> they don't care if they make a mistake. They don't care if they fall down. They don't sit there berating themselves unless they've already learned how to do that from a parent who's still in the grips of their inner critic whose parent before them was probably was as well. But what came to me when I was thinking about walking, and I think it's a really good metaphor for how we function psychologically. I was picturing a scene like downtown on a busy weekday, like in New York City or Chicago or somewhat in LA. People walking around, navigating the sidewalks, going in and out of buildings, anticipating people coming toward them, people coming up behind them, moving out of each other's way. Somehow, unbelievably, we almost all become highly competent walkers, <laughs> right? We learn how to walk. But what would happen if our self-judgment and criticism and shame and embarrassment had earned an end to that process when we were eight months, 10 months, 12 months, 14 months old, and we never learned how to walk. And so the image that was coming to me was people downtown all right, but everybody's falling over each other. <laughs> Nobody knows how to stand, yeah. let alone walk. Yeah. So not only does it become impossible for me to move with any intentionality because I don't have the motor ability to do that, but I'm constantly running into everybody else as I'm in the process of falling down, causing them to fall down. Yeah. And to me, that's where we all are, psychologically speaking. <laughs> Not in terms of our ability to walk, but in terms of what we're able to utilize in terms of how do we support ourselves better. And then the other piece about learning to support myself better in terms of autonomy is I can also not only not knock you down, but I can help stabilize you if you get unsteady and you reach out to me for help. And if I'm in the middle of falling down myself because I haven't known how to cultivate that kind of stability, I'm going to pull you right down with me because I'm going to grab onto you to try to keep myself up, which is exactly in the couple that you describe in detail in this chapter, Alan, in your book, it's exactly what the, the guy in the relationship is doing repeatedly and in her own way, although she's coming to more and more autonomy, the, the woman in, in the uh, extended case history. Yeah. So. So I think it is a really fitting metaphor. And again, it's not about pathologizing any of this. 
we we just haven't learned yet what we haven't learned. As Herb loves to say, we don't know what we don't know. And very often, for a long, long time, we don't know that we don't know it. <laughs> okay. We just don't until we, we t- start paying more attention mm-hmm. to, to our anxiety and how it try to influence other people to, to mitigate my anxiety, to help me with it. And then learning to ask questions like, okay, I'm becoming aware of my emotional dependency. And you, you do address this in your chart, Alan, that you talk about in this chapter. What, what would it look like for me to provide a little bit more self-support in this specific situation? What specifically would that sound like? What specifically could that look like? Would it involve asking for help? Would it just involve acknowledging, wow, I just became aware of how I want to manipulate you right now, either by intimidating or people pleasing or withdrawing or, you know, resigning myself. Yeah. I mean, there's a million specific ways that we can start to recognize our excessive, unhelpful emotional dependencies for a million different situations that we're in with a whole bunch of different people. But that that's where the awareness can begin like you said, Al, with starting to identify with as little judgment as possible, as, or as you hear me say over and over, to bring my judgment into it, to just acknowledge my judgment. It's just part of the flow of my experience. Unless I have a powerful should around it, then I can even acknowledge that. So again, self-acceptance is the key. And when, I'm not, when I don't have it, I can acknowledge I don't have it toward a part of myself or something I'm doing or saying. But without acceptance, as you said, Al, we will not make progress with any of this. The beautiful thing is we can even talk about accepting our resistance, accepting our pride, accepting our imperfection, accepting our ego, accepting that we don't want to be admitting any of this. Yeah. We can begin there. It's hard to begin there. Our pride, ego, all of it, you know, pseudo self-esteem, doesn't want to acknowledge any of that but we can make small steps so i'll let it go with that thank you you guys yeah thank you Speaking of small steps and you reminded me also a part of my awareness as uh, alan was talking and that is the improved consciousness has made me more aware of my influence impact on other people that's where it really started the first time i was just horrified as yeah. I looked at my behavior and its motives, but more especially at the impact of my behavior on other people. And that's a sensitivity that has grown in me and been consciously cultivated, to use your word, Alan, uh, in terms of how am I impacting uh, other people? So. Yeah, that's so important, Herb. And again, I'm so glad you brought that up because we can hear the message about emotional dependency saying because again there's so many aspects to it and so many parts and moving parts right that we can get the message of i should pay less attention to other people i shouldn't be aware of other people that's that's not there's no one thing that's it all right there's no one piece of this that's the whole story a big part of becoming less emotionally dependent is paying more attention to our impact on other people Because in the self-centeredness, extreme self-centeredness of our emotional dependency, we're not doing that. Alan, you said it beautifully. We want to be understood without extending understanding. We want to be seen without seeing. We want to, you know, have somebody understand and recognize our emotional experience and validate it and accept it when that's the last thing we are doing to them. Or, or for them, with them right. in that moment. So I, I really, I, I'm really happy. We're at, you know, all the chapters are, are really, really good. I've told you that before. Uh, it's a very well-written, uh, thoughtful uh, book. But I'm really glad we're into the meat of yeah. emotional dependency. We yeah. are into it. Does someone need to believe in God to successfully overcome addiction? Well, the way I like to think about what the program does, it connects us to who 
we really are. And what does that mean? Well, there's this incredible force in you and I, this growth force. It's the force that moved us from crawling to walking. You wanted to take those first steps. And when you fell, and you fell a lot of times, you didn't let your failures stop you. You picked yourself up, you learned from it. And how many times did you fail before you walked? You failed as many times as you needed to. You see that force, I call it a biological imperative, a psychological imperative, a spiritual imperative. It's moving you towards wholeness. It's moving you to be what you can be. Just like in the acorn is all the information it needs to become an oak tree. In you is all the information you need to become you. Become a you that can cope with life and to deal with whatever you need to deal with to be okay. And that's what I'll talk about in my new book, The 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety.